it's about, which is about giving children a voice uh, to um, articulate their experiences and not suppress uh, traumatic experiences. This is something I feel very, very passionate about, and particularly groups of children who are marginalized, who are on the outside um, of um, most of our society. So what I'm going to be talking to you about today is um, a lot of the issues that myself and a really um, strong group of academics in the UK addressed in the book Safeguarding Black Children. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why we wanted to focus on a book specifically about black children and what some of the issues are in the UK that are unique and particular to different groups of black children. Some of the issues I think will be very similar to some of the things you're grappling with here, but some of the things will be different. Um, and we can um, explore that as, as we go along. Um, I, as I'm speaking, as, a, as I'm prepare, um, presenting, I'm very happy for you to just come in and make contributions, share ideas, share observations, or ask questions as we're going along. So, so please um, don't be inhibited to sort of make, come in and make a contribution. I, I'm not sort of, um, I don't get phased by that. So, and do, do uh, indicate if you, um, at some points, my voice is going and you can't hear me. So I'm going to, in terms of the overview of my presentation, I'm going to um, give an overview of some of the key issues confronting di diverse groups of black children, black and ethnic minority children in the UK. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the social and environmental conditions that frame uh, black and ethnic minority children's experiences. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of religious and cultural beliefs in framing ideas about child rearing practices and the implications of that for um, how we think about harmful behavior and child abuse and neglect. And I'm going to um, look at what some of the challenges are to have uh, respectful interventions with diverse groups of families and pose you some questions for you to take away to reflect on what you need to do and think about in relation to how you develop your practice. But I first wanted to give you um, uh, briefly just some idea of the legal and policy context for uh, child welfare work in the UK. So you have an idea of um, the duties and responsibilities to intervene in families' lives. Um, the main piece of legislation which gives local authorities, child welfare workers, in particular social workers, duties and responsibilities to intervene in families' lives is the 1989 Children Act. Um, and this was amended in 2004. Um, and the, the, the specific sections are uh, section 17, which is about providing support to families for children in need. And section 47, which is the main um, section that is, um, gives duties and responsibilities to intervene when there are concerns about child abuse and neglect. And section 20, which, is the, which provides the um, responsibilities and duties to take children into care, um, and particular um, places a statutory duty on local authorities to um, accommodate unaccompanied and asylum-seeking children. I, I think from what I um, glean from the literature I look at in the US, you use a different terminology to um, describe unaccompanied minors who are migrating. UUMI or something like that, I think you, you describe it as. But, but UASC is commonly how it's referred to in the UK context um, and, in Euro and in much of Western Europe, and, and that is for unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. So the, the, in terms of the statutory responsibility, the 1989 Children Act 
um, specifically gives powers to the police, clinical commissioning groups within the N National Health Service and within education and local authorities to um, make arrangements for multi-agency working to safeguard and to promote the welfare of um, children. And most of that is set out in the document called Working Together to Safeguard uh, Children. And I've given you, in, in the terms of the slides, I've given you the um, link to, so you can access that Working Together um, document to see how it sets out the responsibilities and the duties of everyone who has um, some a remit around supporting and safeguarding children. So why a book specifically about black children? And for, for, for us who contributed to the book, we were very mindful that as the black and ethnic minority children have become much more diverse culturally, ethnically, linguistically in the UK, there were particular issues that were emerging which were raising challenges for child protection, child welfare workers. It's important to um, understand that black children from varying ethnicities, uh, so for example, you've got black children that have recently migrated from different countries from the continent of Africa, alongside black children from African and Caribbean backgrounds who are fourth and fifth generation born uh, in the UK. So th these are children whose grandparents may have come on after the Second World War into, into Great Britain. And then in addition to that, you've got newly arriving uh, unaccompanied asylum-seeking children, you, mainly from places like Eritrea, Sudan, Somalia, and other parts of um, the African continent. So it sort of raised questions and challenges for child welfare workers in terms of the multifaceted nature of the issues that were emerging in terms of how we thought about what is harmful behavior, what is good enough parenting, um, et cetera, to make professional judgments about where, whether children were being harmed by the environments they were in. So the book covered a range of topics to address those concerns. So the effects of mental health was a, is a key chapter in the book because again in the UK context, black people are disproportionately represented in the welfare um, services, mental health welfare services. There's also a chapter on the effects of domestic violence, living in an environment where domestic violence, domestic abuse was a, was a key factor. And I know that particularly for, for most of you who are practitioners uh, in child welfare know that domestic violence is a key uh, issue that um, has to be addressed and in terms of thinking about the impact. So we know that domestic violence is not just something that occurs in um, particular minority groups, it, 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 it occurs across all socioeconomic backgrounds and racial backgrounds, but we wanted to address the particular barriers that may frame and compound black children's experiences differently to other groups of children. Over the last 15 years or so, the, the last 10 years or so in, in the UK, there has been increasing concern about gang uh, affected um, youth and particularly those young people who are living in neighborhoods that are affected by gang um, activity and although most of the young people most of the young black people are not involved in gangs themselves but the fact that they're living in neighborhoods and environments um, where gang activities activity is taking their place it it impacts their their day-to-day -day lived experiences um, and their families' lived experiences. So again, we wanted to highlight those issues in a child welfare, a child protection context to think about um, some of those issues. And the book also has chapters on the different categories of, of child abuse and neglect, um, child sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, 
and emotional abuse. And again, significantly drawing out the particular uh, unique issues that are, are raised for, um, for black uh, children. And again, for those of you who are child welfare professionals, I'm sure you know the challenges that arise in, in trying to engage fathers and in, in doing child protection work, because much of, the, much of our attention often in child welfare work is focused on mothers, often in a very negative way um, and in a very oppressive way to um, work with mothers around some of the concerns going on for their children. And often fathers are often in the background somewhere. Um, <coughs> so we wanted to highlight a particular, the particular issues for trying to engage black fathers, black fathers who are often demonized in a way and dehumanized in a way. We wanted to um, highlight some of the issues um, and some of the barriers and some of the opportunities for engaging black fathers in um, child welfare work. And unique to some communities, some black communities in the UK, and again, another emerging child protection problem is the, the issue about accusation about witchcraft. Um, forced marriage is, is uh, also an issue, particularly forced marriage of underage girls. <coughs> Female genital mutilation is also a particular issue that's uh, faced um, some groups of black children, uh, groups of black children largely from Somalia background, but also from some other parts of the African continent. Um, and child trafficking was also emerged as a major issue that we needed to think about the particular issues for, for, for groups of black children. And then the book has a chapter that addresses some of the issues around unaccompanied asylum seeking children. And all the chapters in the book are written by key experts in those areas, but key experts who have an intersectionality framework and perspective to make sense of those issues and have um, um, frameworks such as critical race theory to bring an understanding and insight into these experiences. So we, myself and Dr. Polita Harris, my colleague who edited the book, were um, were really pleased that we had some of the key experts in the UK who, who were writing about the various chapters in the book. I'll pause here for a minute, just in case you have any questions, any reflections, any observations, any thoughts? Are you all with me still? OK, good. OK, so I'll just go through now and talk about what we saw as some of the risks to black children and how those risks are understood and constructed. So as I've said before, um, accusations about witchcraft are, is a key issue um, that emerged in the UK about 10 years ago. Um, and it emerged, um, it emerged in the sense where a, a four-year-old boy, the torso of a four-year-old boy, uh, he had no head and no limbs. He was found, the body, the torso was found in the, in the River Thames. And the work that had to go on to, 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 to be done by the police and forensic teams to try and identify who this, who this child was, um, to sort of try and make sense of his experiences, and that took about a good year before he was identified as a boy, a four-year-old child from Nigeria. And they identified which part of Nigeria and where he came from. And identified that he had been trafficked um, to be used for sacrifice, to be used as sacrifice for witchcraft kind of practices. Now, that really woke up woke everybody up in the UK because those are things that was not on our, our radar at all in terms of thinking about um, child protection practice. practice. And that invited um, the police and social services 
to actually really look at how do they monitor and are they are they do they know all the children who may be living in their geographical area it really kind of invited um, the police and social services to really think about do we know if we have an account of every child who's living in in our neighborhood and once they started to do that work they identified that they had a number of children that nobody knew what happened to them where what, a number of black children nobody knew what happened to them so it sort of it sort of really stimulated a little thinking about trafficking and child trafficking Female genital mutilation, and I'm sure in parts of the US here, there are, there are probably very similar debates that's gone on in the UK. And a lot, and, and a lot of the drivers behind that was very much women from, Soma from the Somalian communities and other um, African background communities actually campaigning and raising awareness as to female genital mutilation. Because although in, in the UK there had been a law um, since the 1990s ab about um, banning f um, gen female genital mutilation but nothing really was much was done about that until two years ago there was a real raising of you know, public awareness about the issue and really strengthening the law to actually um, address um, female genital mutilation Honor-based violence uh, are, 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 is also um, something that impacts particularly groups of black um, young women in particular, and forced marriages, as I said. So it really kind of galvanized those of us in child welfare to think differently about child, child abuse and neglect, but also to think about, well, how do you respectfully um, engage in dialogues and conversations with families who you may be working with whose cultures and beliefs are very different to your own but not lose sight of children's rights and children's um, the responsibility we have for, ch for keeping children safe and particularly when some of those practices fall into the realm of being child abuse and, and our human rights violation as well as female genital mutilation is a is a um, forced marriage honor based violence they're all human rights violation as well so it's kind of ha inviting us to think about what what sort of dialogues and conversations do we need to have to navigate that tension of respecting people's values and beliefs and their cultures that they bring but also um, keeping of uh, children and the rights of children as the central focus of what we're doing. Go ahead. Um, with issues like human trafficking, witchcraft, self, uh, gangs, um, what is your collaboration with the child welfare agencies? Like, do you know? Okay, so, so much in terms of the, the going back to the legislative framework that I s outlined at the beginning, where it gave responsibilities to key agencies like the police social services, education departments, health professionals to work in a um, collaborative way. So each geographical area, we call them, in, in, in England we call them boroughs, counties, in some outside of the major cities they call counties. So each borough or a council would have a multi-agency um, child protection, safe, they call si safeguarding boards that have a responsibility to draw up procedures and policies for working with child protection and also um, f for doing multi-agency training to work in child welfare. So that's where that kind of thinking would take place in those multi-agency frameworks, boards. And then within that there are several sub-boards that focus on particular areas. So there will be a sub-board that f focuses on unaccompanied minors. There'll be one that will be focusing on sexual exploitation. There'll be one that will be focusing on gang, um, working with um, gang activity, et cetera. So the different areas. Um, and we, there are several um, guidance documents specifically focusing on those different areas. And at the end of the 
presentation, I've, I've given you the links to all those guidance documents so you can see and get in a sense of how it sets out the responsibilities um, of different um, agencies and different individuals within that. So there are multi-agency forums where a lot of that discussion and work takes place. Well, the, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are lots of community activism g groups that are doing a lot of that groundwork. And for female genital mutilation, it was very much from the ground where it was um, women, feminists, black feminists and black women who organize around gender-based violence would, had done that work and lobbied the various people within the government, etc to bring about that change. Um, and then that influenced um, the various government departments, because most of the statutory gu guidance that child welfare workers use to frame their interventions are developed uh, at central government level. Um, so that groundwork that was being done on the ground um, was used to inform and influence and obviously academics were doing research and different players were in different forums doing the work to influence the way the legislation has been framed to, to do that. Uh, in relation to the legislation, there are legislation now around female genital gen mutilation and around forced marriage um, and honor-based violence. The legislation again for um, around forced, the, the evidence to inform the framing and the development of the legislation um, around that was very much influenced by research that was done by academics at university, but also influenced by the activism that were being done in, uh, in communities. So in the UK, there are very, very strong um, activism that influences. So in London, in the London area, there is a um, a group called Southall Black Sisters who are um, largely Asian women but they do a lot of with a very clear strong feminist um, perspective. I think from one of the things I think is different in the UK and compa compared to the US, broadly the US, from what I can see and know about the research that's done, well two things that are different. We still have a welfare state in the, in the UK and there is still a lot of the policies around domestic violence, honor-based violence, et cetera, have been very much influenced by feminist thinkers. That's really shaped the way those policies has been developed. So I think that makes a sig significant difference. And that's been the driver behind the, those who have been activism in, uh, at a local level. And then there are non, there are, you know, not-for-profit organization. For example, there is a not-for-profit organization called AFRUCA. The, the, it's African United Against Child Abuse, something like that. And they do a lot of work around educating and raising awareness within African communities around um, educating around what is acceptable and not acceptable in the UK context. And, but also helping them to garner their own resources and, and the, the, the good things from their, their own cultural traditions to bring that to our attention that we can see, use it as a resource, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so. I wanted to just give you, say, uh, say something very briefly about unaccompanied asylum seeking children, just to give you um, <coughs> a sense of the numbers. And th this is the latest data, for, um, which was um, 2017. Um, there were 4,560 unaccompanied asylum seeking children um, in the UK. And these would be children from, um, from the African continent, but also children from places like um, Afghanistan, um, 
Iraq, Iran, um, um, the, those parts of the, the Middle East as well. Um, and 78% of those, um, they, I, I don't have the break breakdown in terms of how many of those children were from the African continent. They haven't broken that down. But 78% um, of unaccompanied asylum-seeking children were aged 16 and over. So in terms of going back to the legislation that I outlined at the beginning in terms of the responsibility to accommodate unaccompanied minors, with regards to 16 years old and over, 16 to 18, the local authorities will, prob will probably, the, the minimum they would do would be to pay for accommodation and give them um, a daily living allowance. Um, if they're under the age of 16, they will kind of take them into the care system so the local authority becomes their corporate parent in that sense. And, and some of the work would be done to actually um, secure their um, status, their immigration status. With the, usually the 16 to 18-year-olds, eight, once they reach 18, the local authorities have no responsibility for them. And a number of those children are usually sent back to their countries of origin. Um, and there are key issues that usually raised about age assessment because one of the things that local authorities, when, when unaccompanied minors appear at the different port entries, they are usually um, distributed across the UK. Um, so each local authority would have a, a particular quota a number that they will need to take. So they're distributed um, uh, across the rest of the UK. Um, but one of the real contentious issues is about how do you make age appropriate assessment? Because local authorities have to um, make assessments as to whether or not the, children, the, the teenagers, young people are under the age of 18. And sometimes they, they may be over the um, you may suspect that they're probably a little bit older. I know when I was working as a practitioner, we had much more flexibility to kind of fudge it a bit, to think, well, they may be a bit older, but we won't. As you didn't tell me any your age. You know, there is less flexibility now for um, practitioners to actually um, do that. So there is usually real contention as to, um, is, this, is this young person older than they are, you know, in terms of physiologically, emotionally, psychologically, etc. So those are areas that often could be quite discriminatory for, for, for young people. And we know from the research and things that unaccompanied children are often very vulnerable uh, and may be at risk of going um, missing. Because sometimes um, unaccompanied minors may be sent by their parents with an adult who may or may not be a blood relative. Um, they may be taken into the care system um, and then they disappear after a couple of days. And usually those are some of the young people who may have been trafficked for um, sexual exploitation or for um, labor exploitation and modern slavery. That, that's the other thing that the UK has had to introduce in the last few years is a piece of legislation about modern slavery because it recognizes that children and adults are trafficked um, in the UK for, for and held as slaves. So those, that's just something very briefly about unaccompanied um, asylum-seeking children. And I don't know if that's, is that different for you out, particularly in, in, in this part of the US where you are based? Is, that, is this something that you work with? Yeah. And I don't know what happens between, you know, and they often have sponsors and their people, their family members that came before them. Um, so I think that helps them stay in the U.S. Mm. and not have to be sent mm. back. Yeah.
Right. The, of their parents. Right. Their parents, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'll go on now to talk a little bit about the... Are you still with me? You still with yeah, me? Yeah. yeah, good. I'll go on now to talk a little bit about the social conditions and environmental factors that frame uh, black children's lives. And, you know, there is growing evidence uh, in the UK that um, racial minority groups are disproportionately affected by poverty. And as we know, if you are affected by the people who are most affected by poverty are over overrepresented in the child welfare system as a consequence. And there is kind of much more research that articulates much more clearly that children who are living in families affected by factors such as um, by poverty essentially is, uh, is, is caused by social inequalities. So things like poverty, unemployment, living in economically disadvantaged neighborhood, those children are at the greatest risk of child welfare interventions. As I said before, uh, in the UK, ethnic minority groups experience disparities in mental health in terms of access to care and treatment for mental ill health. And the little bit I know about the research in the US, I get the sense there are some similar processes um, here as well around, around that. And we, um, in terms of thinking about some of the social conditions, it's about recognizing also that families who are new migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees experience practical as well as cultural barriers, which can lead to a poor service for, um, from children's services and mental health services. They may just get the bare minimum intervention. And certainly in the UK, um, and I know, um, I know it ha it's it here as well, similar debates are happening, that research is really, tr really now recognizing um, that racism and racial discrimination can undermine some parents' capacity to um, parent well because of the stresses created um, around that. We also know that racism undermines children's emotional and psychological well-being, and it's recognizing and un understanding that. And in the chapters, particularly the chapters on the chapter in the book on emotional abuse, um, that chapter really, as well as um, looking at emotional abuse, parental emotional abuse, also looks at the sort of societal um, emotional abuse that black children experience. And, I, and again, from what I know about the research and what I read about what's going on here in the US, USA, I know there is something very similar going on about this sort of racial battle fatigue that black parents have to just uh, constantly um, manage. Um, and recognizing, so, so how we need to recognize when parents are, the, the, the resources, the qualities, the things they bring to um, nurture children who are resilient and hopeful um, in a society where they're sort of undermined and devalued. Um, recognizing that parents have to do something over and above what a lot of parents have to do. So it's those sorts of issues I think we try and pull out in the book to, to explore. And recognizing also that race is often an important factor influencing black and minority ethnic children's experiences of abuse and neglect. Um, and most importantly, their experiences of the child protection system, the child welfare system. So there are two things there. There is the how does it impact how they internalize uh, and make sense of their experiences of being abused within their families. But also, how do we understand the welfare systems that we work within, how does that, does that compound or contribute to that uh, a devaluation of children, or does it um, uplift and empower children to make sense of their experiences? So those are some of the factors that we thought it was important to 
um, address in the book. I'll pause here again. Any, any, any thoughts or any ideas on those, those um, points that I've just raised? Any? Go, go ahead. Yes, yes, there is, and particularly in the metropolitan cities where most, you know, um, black and ethnic minority population live, there is. But the, I suppose, what the book, a book like ours, is also suggesting that it isn't, it isn't, it isn't, oh, it isn't sufficient just to employ more, um, more black and ethnic minority professional workers you also have to do something to look at the culture of the organization. Because bringing in a diverse um, workforce into an organization does not necessarily mean it changes the, the um, organization. You also have to look at the culture of that organization and the, the structures in the, in the organization, where often the sort of um, nuanced kind of discrimination manifests. Because in the UK, most of the diversity in the in social work is is at the bottom so most of the workers at the front line but if you've got the managers who are making the decision of you know white and male etc then you know diddly squat happens really it's <laughs> <laughs> an American term isn't it <laughs> 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 nothing much happens to bring about change real change in that sense in that sense and in the UK now, there is um, what, what's called um, users by experts. Um, users by experts, it means service users. People who use services are also um, on advisory groups in local authority, social services departments. Um, they're also are on advisory groups in university programs where they contribute to the delivery of programs because that's valuable in terms of helping us to think, well, what difference are we making in what we're trying to do if we don't have the people who receive those services and might have something very different to say about how good it is are not involved in the delivery of social work education, but also in terms of the delivery of social work services. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's very similar to here, isn't it? Yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, and there's, a, there's a lot of resistance. A lot of resistance. I was thinking about how impressive it is that you were talking about the feminist activists at the lower levels or in the communities and, and that they had um, effects on policy and do they also attempt to affect this? Yes, yes. Yes, they do. Yes. But you know the, you, you, you know the struggles in terms of to bring about real change. You've seen it recently in, your, in terms of your Supreme Court and just following what was going on, that, that real um, change at the top is, is, a, is, is resisted um, in, in a sense. OK, so I'll, I'll go on now to talk a little bit about, um, about religious and cultural beliefs. because. The UK, is a, the UK is a secular society. Um, you know, this idea that whatever people do in there, um, there is a separation from the state and um, um, religion and the church. There's, there's a separation. So this notion that whatever people want to do in their private space, it's up to them. But in the public spaces, like schools and, and um, social services, we don't get involved in um, debates about education. Well, over the last few years, we've had to revisit those debates because uh, in the UK, the rising number of people who um, faith and beliefs are cr critical to their day-to-day -day living are the n recent migrants, the black and ethnic minority communities. The numbers where church attendance and um, faith is declining is the, sort of, is the indigenous white population 
where it's, it's declining, but it's rising in relation to more recent migrants. So we've had to revisit the debates about religion beliefs in terms of thinking about it in terms of child welfare and social work. And it required the thinking around, again, you know, the tensions around recognizing, understanding, and valuing that for some um, minority ethnic communities, their faith and belief would be central to their well-being, their um, sense of belonging, their sense of um, um, feeling well-grounded in something, uh, and recognizing that for some places of worship can provide important social uh, support um, and places of safety and connection um, and places to manage sort of race related stresses so it's kind of recognizing that and recognizing that it can be a resource for parents to parent well but also dealing with some of the tensions that um, um, when families parents use their religious and cultural beliefs as a justification for behaviors that are harmful to their children. And some of the significant child deaths we've had in the UK involving black children have all had a component of faith and belief as to, the, as to influencing the parents' parenting practices that contributed to those children's deaths. So it's kind of, um, it, it's, it's uh, forcing us in child welfare to really start to engage with the issue in terms of trying to manage and navigate how you work with families who may have very different kind of re religious and cultural beliefs and see it as central to how they parent their children. But again, how we, how we um, keep those children's interests as, at the center of what we're doing and call out when there are human rights violation or children are being abused. So those are some of the tensions that we've had to try and um, address in relation to thinking about the, the role of religion and faith for families both its strengths in terms of what families can draw from that, um, but also the areas where it's used as a justification for female genital mutilation, for um, making accusations about witchcraft and physically punishing children, etc., etc. I wonder what people's thoughts are about the, that, and again, how you kind of navigate those those sorts of tensions as, as practitioners. And it's very similar in the UK. It's not, um, it's not illegal in, 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 sorry, in England, in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Because in, in Scotland, they've just um, passed some legislation to ban hit using any kind of physical ways to discipline children. But in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, the rest of the UK, it's, still, it's not illegal. Parents can use reasonable force to um, discipline their children. Similarly, as long as they don't, they don't use, they don't leave any bruises, they don't hit over the head, and something else. I can't remember what it is. But, you know. um, so it kind of, it, so there's a contradiction there um, for how we think about that. But also, s groups of African children are the, the groups of black children who come into the child protection system, African children, uh, background children, are disproportionately there for physical chastisements, you know. Um, and 
it's important to also look at the language because often in the UK, um, white families and middle class families smack and black families beat. You know, it's a different language that's used because smack just suggests a little tap with, you know, doesn't leave any bruises. Whereas beat, if you're beating your child, it suggests something really violent. And often when I was, when I was a, went out and I was a social worker, it was often um, because parents would always say, I just gave a little snap, a little smack. You know, that happened to leave two broken ribs and something else. Well, that suggested something a little bit more. So it's going back to the points you raised about getting a sense, well, what, what was that whooping? Um, what does that mean? Is it just a little tap with a slipper? Or is it, is it something that leave bruises on children or, or, or broken bones, etc.? And most of the children who've died, the black children who've died in the UK as a result of um, being physically and emotionally abused have been you know, serious, uh, seriously violent beatings. Yes, and, 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 um, and it's those, um, you know, some of the research that's been done in the UK, it's those professional workers who, um, particularly white workers, who are more likely to kind of not want to question too much because they, they're more concerned that they'll be accused of being racist against somebody else's culture. Um, uh, so, that, so you've got that level, and then you've got the other level where it might be, there might be professionals who agree, who, whose own values and beliefs agree that smacking is, or, or beating is, is, is fine. Um, you know, it's been done to me, look at me, it hasn't done me any harm, and you know, those kinds of things, and how they, they, they probably collude with parents because they see it's, it's okay. Um, but essentially, uh, the, the, arg the issue in the UK is that very much that the white professionals are concerned that they will be accused of being racist if they were to question, well, what, what do you mean by, in our culture, we always, um, we always do it this way? Um, well, explain to me, what, what, what do you mean? Because from my understanding, a nine-month-old baby can't get up from the bed and go on into the fridge and get their own dinner. So explain to me. <laughs> explain to me why they were left alone to sort themselves out. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's, it's that thing sometimes where, as if common sense, for some, common sense goes out the window because somebody says, it's part of our culture, we always do it that way. Okay, um, I don't need to, sorry for, for inter disturbing you, and go away rather than asking, well, explain to me how, how this is going to happen. But also, most importantly, in all cultures, some do and some don't. <laughs> You know, there will be some who do, and there, in, in families, there are some who do and some who don't. So we, we, don't, we don't get, but as soon as somebody, it's another culture, and they say it's part of our culture, we just say, okay, and we don't question and, and, and do our assessment in depth because we are worried that we might be perceived to be oppressive in that. So, so it's those kind of tensions that I think it's, it's important for practitioners in their reflective spaces to grapple with those kinds of questions, really. So there is something, uh, 
my reading into what you're saying there is there something racialized going on there? Is that Absolutely. is that what you would you would suggest as well? Yeah, the, there's protections for religion, but when you know somebody says, well, if they come from a minority religion or you know particularly religion, also if you're a Muslim religion, you know that's all a question, and that's you know we should change that, or we can't allow that to happen here. But when it's you know white Protestants or evangelicals, then there's not questions about what they're choosing to do as a religion versus. You know, mm, yeah. Yeah. And those are those those things that it's important to articulate and discuss those, those issues really, to think about whether there is something different in terms of influencing our intervention here. Okay. Go ahead. They're a combination of both. In some, in some parts, there are, so for, for example, in one London borough, in um, the east of, the, of London, there is a large, very large community from um, Somalia and from Bangladesh. And that local authority has a number of practitioners and managers from those communities. But in addition to, to using interpreters, and, and um, most, mostly interpreters are used. To, to work with different communities. And th there, there is a move away from using children in those families to, trans to um, translate for their parents, um, um, particularly when it's around sensitive or, or very difficult issues around domestic violence, abuse, etc. So it's usually uh, working with interpreters. Okay, so so just to summarize around, you know, as I've um, talked about, emerging forms of abuse are bringing new challenges concerning thresholds for intervention for child protection. And religion and faith and their associated cultural dimensions are significant social factors which influence beliefs about child rearing, risks, and what we see as harm. And particularly the way child protection concerns are identified, defined, and responded to. And you know, we've touched on this already, but it's, it's around the, the whole issue about being culturally sensitive versus cultural relativism and the need to distinguish between cultural assets that are seen as strengths in enhancing parents' emotional and practical resourcefulness and where parents draw on cultural practices as a justification for particular um, parental behaviors that may cause harm to their children. So there is a balance to be had um, between being culturally sensitive without resorting to forms of cultural relativism. You know, all Nigerian families are like that, all um, Somalian families are like this, etc. And as I've touched on before, to avoid the unquestioning ex uh, um, acceptance of cultural ex explanations. Go ahead. A good point to raise, and um, and and it also kind of for me, those points it raises the issue about those groups who are under the radar, really, and those groups that are not don't come to the attention of child welfare agencies, particularly the more affluent um, 
because we know when we look at studies, um, adverse childhood experience studies, that data tells us that children from all socioeconomic backgrounds and races are affected by sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse. The difference is some groups come to the under the radar, and because those studies are often re retrospective studies, where it's um, adults talking about their experiences of being their childhood. Um, but we know that there are some groups who don't come um, up for scrutiny, um, but we know that they're being abused. I've just done, I've just completed a research project in lo in, in the UK looking at child neglect in affluent families. Uh, where I interviewed um, child welfare practitioners who intervene in that. And one of the key findings from that is that affluent families, they have the resources, the material resources, to navigate their way out of the child protection system. So, you know, they, they have the capacity, the means to come to meetings with their lawyers, et cetera, et cetera, and just intimidate social workers. So they don't, they come out of the system. So we don't, we don't see them in the data in the same way that poor families um, are just under the scrutiny of welfare agencies in, in a different way. So social class, well certainly in the UK, um, how we think about social class, social class is very um, influential in terms of who comes to the attention and who doesn't. Um, and I don't know whether or not that's an issue here in the US in a, in a similar way. Yeah, some good points there in terms of summarizing those key issues. Um, go ahead. Yeah. They, they 
And and th and those issues you've just talked about the the research I did in on affluent family were very much highlighted, um, but you know as as a factor that so then you would get the local MP would um, would be approaching the director of children's services to say what are you doing here with Joe you know Joe Bloggs the, you know this is a well respected family in the community they, you couldn't possibly you know they couldn't possibly be doing this to their kids you know you have those kinds of things going on so they uh, and managers back down very quickly um, so so so, it's, so so social class and privilege and power is critical as to who gets scrutinized and who doesn't um, and and um, as child welfare workers we bear witness to that and we need to be able to voice those and and, and put those, make visible those issues, because it, it just continually perpetuates this notion that child abuse happens in these kinds of communities and in um, <coughs> this kind of um, social class, rather than it's something that goes on. And we miss those children, in, particularly in affluent families. We miss them in the harm that's being caused to them as well. That, um, and when you do research, when you look at the research where it's um, talking to therapists and counsellors, they tell you a very different story about the experiences of abuse from, from the more affluent background. That's where their stories are, are usually kept in, in, in privately, I think. So some key issues there in terms of thinking about racialized and class-based um, notions and assumptions that frame how we understand child abuse and neglect in, in our societies. So I'll go on now to, um, you know, to think, well, what are some of the challenges? Practitioners, firstly, as a starting point, practitioners need to be able to identify and examine their own racial biases to increase their overall awareness of how their beliefs might impact their work and with different racial and cultural groups. Because a deficit-focused approach with black and ethnic minority families can undervalue the attributes and resources and assets that they bring and will be an obstacle in terms of engaging parents if they're not, if we can't see the strengths in, in terms of what they are bringing. Because it's critically important, uh, we argue in the book, to understand the strategies that families may use to resist oppression and help their children navigate racially hostile environments because that is something that parents, black parents, are having to do to, to help their children develop positive self-esteem and to have hope and to cultivate their re resilience. Um, black parents are having to do that over and above um, um, any of that. So we need to be able to understand families' strategies. Um, and linked to that is the importance of understanding how parents utilize their cultural knowledge to help their children cultivate hope. For culturally competent practice to take place, a, a respectful dialogue is essential for the protection of black and ethnic minority children. So as I said throughout, this. this um, this idea that we have to be able to manage that tension of respectfully um, engaging in conversations with families with cultures that are different to our own whilst at the same time keep children at the center of, our, of what we're doing and not lose sight of their, their rights, their needs, their issues, the issues about any human rights violations for them. And I wanted to end with four key points about the way race and racism shapes um, black children's experiences, but also child welfare um, interventions into black families. And the first one is about recognizing that racism is a key component in the social devaluation of black children. That's something that's very relevant in, in the UK, and I know it's very relevant in the US here. Um, in terms of some of the debates and um, issues that's been going on, particularly around Black Lives Matters, etc., and the racism that's in 
in, in the US societies. So it's recognizing that it's a key component in devaluing um, black children. It's a compounding factor in child abuse. So for how I, um, so what I mean here is how do we try and understand how a black child makes sense of their experiences of being abused and violated within their family, who, and their families are supposed to be a place of safety and protection. Well, how do they make sense of that in, a, in the context of a wider society where they're devalued and they experience or, um, racism? So we need to be able to understand that. Race impacts the lived experiences of, ch uh, of um, child abuse for black children. And importantly, as has been touched on by various, at various times during the presentation, race influences um, our responses to child abuse experiences by black, black children. So I leave you with three questions to, um, to reflect on. And we can start some of that reflection now. And you can take those questions away. And the first one is in a multiracial context with different conceptions of what constitutes harmful behavior. How do we agree a core set of values for safeguarding black and ethnic minority children from harm and exploitation? And in terms of service delivery, what are the concerns and interests of children and families from marginalized racial and ethnic communities? And what are some of the enablers and barriers for addressing and challenging deep-seated um, beliefs about race and culture and child welfare? So those are some of the questions I leave you with. What I'd like you to probably do now is just probably turn around in small groups around you and just kind of start some discussion about your reflections on these three questions. So, so what sort of issues emerged in your discussion? What were the sort of priorities and things that came up for you in terms of thinking about these three areas? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. What about what about for other people? What sort of sort of things came up? Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Uh, and the key challenge is how do you stay with people? knowing that sometimes it can be overwhelming in terms of trying to the changes that um, can be brought about and not losing focus on the child because sometimes the parents needs and issues can be so overwhelming that we can get stuck there rather and lose sight of children so it's balancing those things some good points there what about what about for other any any other thoughts um
Yeah, yeah, some good points there. And in the UK, um, the, the issue about transracial placements um, it, it has always um, raised really kind of difficult conversations. And more recently, the, with the current government that we have in, in the UK, have brought in um, policy and legislation to say that um, social workers should not put that as the priority in terms of trying to find homes for children that uh, you know, the main factor should be that children are in somewhere where they, they could get care, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the matching in terms of race and ethnicity is not a priority anymore in, in the UK. So um, there are different sort of schools of thoughts about that uh, as to what is most important for children. Will you? And some key, key issues there for those of you who are in the front line doing the work and trying to um, find safe, good places for children, um, etc. Any other thoughts? Go ahead. Some good points there in terms of about, I suppose what you're touching on there is the organizational system, but also the, the structural yeah, system around that yeah. uh, are, are also need to be challenged. Yes, it's the same. The same same issues are raised in the U, in the UK as well. But I always say, child, if you're in child protection work, that in itself, you're dealing with some of the most difficult issues. You're having to have some of the most difficult conversations with parents about removing their children, etc. If you're talking to children, you know, discomforting conversations. So I'm always puzzled as to why <laughs> people then get immobilized as soon as you mention race and maybe for some it's about that having to question well how am I located in this am I part of the problem or am I part of the solution 
how is my privilege structured around that? Uh, and maybe sometimes it's about in, in, um, exploring that. But, but I'm always perplexed as to why, in a profession where you're just dealing with such a lot of really discomforting topic areas all the time on a day to day, that suddenly, when as soon as it's about race or so, then everybody becomes immobilized. So, so, so that's a question I, I put there for you to <laughs> go away in your spaces and reflect on that. What, what are the barriers around that? And yeah, what, we talked about that too, um, that we know it needs to be talked about and that's the way to move forward and the conversations are starting, but they start and then they drop because you know once it gets too deep, then it's too difficult and then people don't want to offend anybody and then they kind of shy away from it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then how do you, what's the next step? Like we're, we're amongst other social yeah. workers, we're willing to talk about it, you know, we're very comfortable Amongst ourselves, but like, what's the next step? You mm, know. Mm, yeah, yeah. So it's you know, and that and that that I I would say, checklists or those kinds of are not going to do it. It's about that conversation mm. that you need to have together to, uh, and and deal with the messiness and the, the uncomfortable truths around that is is that that to me is the start really, um, about it. So yeah. So some good points. I just have a quick response to that. Because I was, as I was thinking about it, it's like in all the other areas, I'm a good guy. In that area, if I push too far, I'll be the bad guy. Mm. I don't want to come. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But often we, with farm, with child protection, you're confronting such difficult issues. Anyway, you're having to have those difficult conversations with parents who are f resisting your being involved in their in their lives who are involuntary who are blocking you but you 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 you, you um, persist don't you so what's different about with race so but the key thing i think is about think having to have a conversation about privilege and particularly white privilege and class privilege that's underpinning that sort of resistance to that conversation because then you you then have to think am i part of the problem or possible solution. Go I ahead. think if we come to a common understanding of what the problem is, everybody across the board, then you have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's where people don't want to change the white privilege. You mm -hmm. know, and that's why when, when people are afraid to approach, you know, the, the administration or the the higher the hierarchy, like we have to do something about it. We know what the problem is. But people are afraid to change. Yeah. So it's about change. Yeah. You know, and uh, I, I think that a lot of the the programs um, that are, you know, kids are going through undergrad and grad programs need to include the, the history of this country, you know, as a part of the curriculum, especially when we work with different multicultural groups. Not just, I mean, the conversations are great, and it's great that people are having the conversations, but until you really understand the real nature of what actually happened to the different ethnic and racial groups, you know, the policies that were put in place that to, to hold them down and to suppress them, then nothing's going to change conversation and keep going around and around but until you know there's true education the real education that's incorporated incorporated into what's being taught um that, nothing's going to change mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. you know we have to um change how we educate um different providers coming up different students coming up and um and just continue with the, the, the conversations yeah that's a good point okay and any other thoughts any other observations or Okay, well, let's bring the session to a close, and thank you very much for your um, attention. What I've tried to do is just give you an overview of some of the issues around child abuse and neglect and child protection affecting uh, some black children in the UK context. Uh, so thanks very much for your attention this morning.